To get this thing straight, we've got to return the planet to nature in as good a condition as we found it. And we should be way, finding ways to improve the stability of the planet and not the financial cupidity of the inhabitants. We are just approaching the whole thing in a completely wrong way. Now, if the Zen man was involved in something like this, he would point out another factor that comes into our thinking, which doesn't necessarily represent general public thinking. If we are, uh, as Socrates said, if we are to live beyond the grave, if some part of us goes on, then we may have to face the answers to a great many questions. He did not believe in damnation, but he believed that the individual might have to discover how ignorant he had been, which would be a great shock to him, especially his ego. Or, on the other hand, is he going down to a silence and will never be heard of or seen or thought of again? Is he a mortal creature with nothing beyond the grave? With either perspective, I think Socrates is more or less correct. If you do not have any life beyond this one, live this one as well and fully as you can. If there is a life beyond this one, if there is something afterwards, then prepare for that by revealing the very best of your nature and turning this world into a school where you learn something every day. We are here to learn, not luxuriate. And we've lost sight of those valuable points. Then we also have the, another point, another hindrance. And that hindrance is a problem that we call vice. Hindrance is uh, largely a matter of providing the funds to allow the individual to dissipate in any manner possible without being able to be properly punished. He will buy, he will buy his exemption from the natural consequences of his own conduct. This is available to us in every newspaper today. It is present in our attitude towards entertainment, towards literature, towards art, towards music. Everything shows a complete disregard for the very plan that produced us. Here we are, very complicated creatures. The human body is one of the greatest mysteries of all time. Whatever it was that created it, fashioned it, or put it together, was a genius beyond anything we can even conceive. Here we are in the presence of an absolute miracle. And then we turn around and feed it with heroin and cocaine. We have not thought about the values of anything. We want to have that feeling of superiority. We want to spend more. We want to have more vices and, um, and more moral delinquencies than anybody else. This is great. But what does it amount to? Nothing. Now, it seems to me that one of the problems we're facing now in the shift into another century is that we cannot go on as we have. <clears throat> we cannot keep on with this process of constantly breaking every rule in a desperate effort to be happy. We cannot go on destroying our earth right out from under us. We cannot continue to abide by simple selfishness. We've got to find ways of doing things right, doing things with discipline and order. Now, one way, of course, is ordinary education. Our ordinary education, if the textbooks were honestly written and the courses were honestly taught and the running the institutions were sufficiently enlightened to know the difference between reality and error, we would be much further ahead. But we cannot expect this or demand it at the moment, although it is definitely coming. At the moment, we can depend only on what we can do. And it may well be that the average person who wants to have a better life may have to start educating himself after the schools have given him all they can. He may have to build his own Zen life, which is something in which he begins to impose a discipline upon his own spoiled nature. 
If you neglect a child up to its tenth or twelfth year, you're going to have a lot of trouble with it. If you neglect the adult human being after middle life who has had no training in doing things right, you're going to have a difficult time, and so is that person. Yet it is necessary for each individual who wishes to get out of any problem he's in, and nearly everyone is in several, is to begin the cultivation, the cultivation of an internal life that is appropriate to the needs. So Zen says, do it by various small, small, short steps at first. Do things that you think can be done with proper with propriety. Keep appointments correctly. Get over pushing anything into the future that needs solution now. Stop trying to be happy all the time with pleasures that mean nothing. Try to escape, for instance, the hypnosis of the television. Uh, try to not become completely addicted to the dynamic divinity of the computer. Let us gradually recognize that the products of our ingenuity are interesting, but it is the being that created these products and can, can create still better ones that is something to be considered and given attention. We've got to begin to be truthful. We've got to le learn to get over extravagance. We don't need everything that we want. We have to begin to curb our transportation. We're going to have cars about blocking every road in the world. We have to get over our dissipations. We have to get over the tremendous money we are wasting and begin to put a discipline upon our life. Pythagoras set up a discipline system that was quite proper. He began with a retrospection. Every night before a person goes to bed or goes to sleep, they should think over the day that has just passed. What did they do that was good? What did they fail to do that should have been done? And what did they do that was against the best of all concerned? How did we use that day? Did we use it? Did we abuse it? Did we waste it? And if we can't say that we used it, we better try a little harder tomorrow. Every individual should check upon his own conduct. There's no use putting a psychiatrist on it. It's not necessary. It, it, they can't do anything for the most part if the individual himself does not want to. And the individual who really wants to is a person who desires to, bet, to have a better life, to get over all the frictions and losses and sorrows and struggles that have been his burden since the beginning of his existence here. It's a matter of getting hold of these things and doing something about them. Then in the evening, then in the morning, when he gets up, or by while he's still in bed, give ten minutes, five minutes, whatever time is available, to a plan for a good action that day. That some bill that's been cold, we'll pay it. Some friend we should have called up on the phone, we'll call them. Uh, some neighbor who asked a favor, we will try and grant it. Now we, if we have visitors coming in, we will be prepared for them. If we don't want them, we should not invite them. And if we do invite them and they come, we should be nice to them. We should try to make things as they are, factual, simple, direct, and with all these things, no regrets, no wishing they hadn't come, no wondering why they didn't do something better, not blaming someone because they didn't send us a Christmas card, getting rid of all this type of thing, and live in a quiet, calm acceptance of the inevitability of the now, that we are here to in a quiet and steadfast way unfold the locked potential within ourselves. We can control our reading. We can control our activities. We can also control the need for a talent or an ability. If we are going to recreate, we must recreate constructively, never as a waste of time. If we want to gain knowledge, we should study it. If we want to gain pleasure, we should learn the arts or something by means of which we discipline ourselves. We must also recover from the observation complex. 
the individual who thinks they are improving by merely watching somebody else work. The individual who goes to the museum and appreciates the art but would never think of studying anything themselves. Each individual should try to release the potential within themselves under the discipline of proper self-control. They should be doing the thing that they need to do in order to grow, in order to fulfill the proper destiny. If they do not grow, they are going to die as ignorant as when they were born. And no individual who passes out of this life without discovering something of distinct value. Any individual who can pass out of this life without saying at least under his own breath, I have learned something and I am a better person. If this happens, something is very wrong with all of civilization, because that is why we are here. Now another point is important to realize that good, the good life, the Pythagorean discipline, does not result in a cold, hard existence. We are not supposed to lose a sense of humor. We're not supposed to become grouchy. We're not supposed to become so superior that we can't get along with other people. The most in, in, in unimportant person in the world is the one who thinks he's more important than anyone else. We should be always learning to grow graciously, to unfold and develop the, abili the abilities that we have with kindness, with charity, and with good humor. The person with no sense of humor is in a bad way. Even the Greek philosophers were very definitely inclined to humor. They believed that humor was important. Humor to laugh with people but not at them. Humor to carry along interesting stories that in a gentle way sometimes have very great meaning. So we have to do all that we can while we're here to simplify, directionalize our efforts. We must not take it for granted that we are simply here to wait for the inevitable end. We have many people come who tell me that they wish they were dead. Those people haven't lived. They haven't discovered the value of life at all. A few infirmities, a few disabilities, or some bereavements, They've taken away from them their own sense of judgment. Everyone has a right to wish to be living as long as he can live and learn. And when he reaches a point where he can no longer learn, then and then only does life become meaningless. And sometimes that happens when he's born. And we never do get, he never does catch up with the tremendous privilege of being alive. So the Zen man looks out of the window and he sees a beautiful garden out there. The same garden uh, that the great Mandarin had. He sees a world of wonders and a world of great and glorious opportunities uh, to help. But he will not see any desire to cut up a piece of it and call it his own. There is nothing in this world that is more foolish than ownership. Nobody owns anything. We don't really own our own bodies. We don't own anything and the Emancipation Proclamation didn't liberate us from ignorance, which is the only enslavement that is real. We therefore have no really, no priority upon tremendous gains in land. We don't need to cheat farmers out of their soil. We do not need to destroy our competitors. These things are all part of the great ignorance when all there is left that we really need to consider is to be productive, useful, and creative people, doing the good deed that comes to our hand and doing it with all the heart and joy that we have. The Zen man will never have a broken heart because he does not live that way. He does not think that way. You can't really have a broken heart if you don't dislike anyone or dislike anything. And if you dislike yourself, you have to get over that also. There are no broken hearts where there is wisdom, because where there is wisdom, there is love. And where there is love, there is never a broken heart. There may be hurts and pains, but through them all comes the deep realization of an infinite reality and a kinship with all that lives that cannot be destroyed by any event 
that may occur in a personal life. So we say now, here's a, here's a man who's going to be a talk broker. We're going to start him out very simply. We're going to start him out in the morning with his childhood prayer. When he's a small child, he's going to make pray in the morning. Two or three minutes with his mother or parent or whoever is with him. He's going to learn to begin in the beginning the reality of God. He's going to learn that there is a divine power that shapes our ends. He's going to realize that he's going to come into a world of divine principles which he is able to help or hurt according to his own attitudes. As he gets a little older and goes to school, it's going to be very important that in his life some elder, not in the school faculty, is going to help to maintain his integrity in the usage of knowledge. He is also going to learn at that point how to help in the maintenance of the establishment that he belongs to. He's going to help in the garden. He's going to help in the cleaning of the house. He is not going to permit all this work to be done either by the rest of the family or by hired help alone. He is going to be part of a family which means to work with the family, to do things, and not to run away and have a big time with the boys down on the vacant lot. The uh, problem is going to learn to begin to realize his dependence upon life. He's going to learn to respect his elders. He's going to learn how they lived, how they made their way. If they are very wealthy, he should probably develop pity for them. If they were very poor, pity. If they were in the middle bracket, they were the most fortunate, and they should be uh, congratulated. But he should start in with a social life, with a life of belonging to humanity. It may very well be good for him to join some youth organization, like the Boy Scouts or something, to get a little bit of the idea of, of working together on problems. When he goes to school, if he's going to be a stockbroker, he might very well to take a course in law as a lawyer, or perhaps as a psychiatrist. Don't take a course in business, because that will make an atheist out of you quicker than anything you can do. <laughs> but take some course, maybe fine letters. Maybe if come, like we have a potential stockbroker who begins as a watercolor painter. Whatever it is, something that gives uh, existence and reality to some gentle light within himself. Something that makes him feel good by doing something nice and uh, doing something that's not for profit. And if he takes any kind of work to start with, he should be, give himself fully to it. He should be taught by his family or by experience that if he is employed and paid for employment, he is expected to go do the good day's work. He is not provided with any uh, inducements to do something wrong, however, or he leaves the job. All along the way, and if he decides later to marry and raise a family, all the way along he is human. He knows poverty. He has seen the sick. He understands loss. He realizes the temptation of wealth. He realizes the temptation of power. And realizes that if he expects any special reward, he must earn that reward by his own personal conduct and not by his friends or some political pull somewhere. He must earn whatever good he hopes. And as he gradually gets uh, to middle life with this kind of a point of view, in a good family life, has good friends, he will probably be not likely to go to become a stockbroker. He probably won't want to be, because he will see too much there that is not real. But if he does become a stockbroker, he will understand fully the problems of loss and profit. He will understand that if he is investing the funds he has saved for a lifetime on the stock deal, he is foolish. If he is putting in more than he can afford to lose, he is foolish. If he is tempting someone else to do the same thing, he is dishonest. If he wishes to do it himself, he must then be prepared as a Zen man to accept loss. If it happens that his fortune is entirely lost, he must be able to have the same peace of mind and the same quietude of spirit 
and the same recognition of the divine purpose in things as he had when he was at the top of the financial pile. If the loss of uh, what he has detracts from what he is, there's been a double tragedy. The dead man, however, will not be caught in that. He will not be caught by anything of that nature. If he should, which is unlikely, ever invest in anything of that nature, he will lose the perfect contemplation of what am I learning? What am I gaining in terms of eternal realities? Is this another lesson to prove me that I shouldn't fool with these things? which are of no value. So what should the Zen man then do instead of investing in such speculation? Well, the best thing that he can do is to inv is invest in the perfection or development of his own nature. We are all full of opportune factors. We are all of us full of potentials. There is something in every human being that never gets a chance to come out because the outside is so active and oppressive and is so distant that there's never a chance for the inside to come out. Instead of using our years simply to try and make it easier here where it will never be easier anyway, it is better to try to develop the power to become a citizen of the universe, to a citizen of, the, of tomorrow a citizen of a world that is bigger than ourselves. Uh, Dharuma, the original teacher of Zen, was a believer in reincarnation. He believed in it as most Buddhists do. And he also realized that the tomorrow is simply a, a checkup. It is a balancing of the books. And that what we do and what we learn and what we contribute to the common good, these are the great wealths. To the Zen man, wealth is, the, is good karma. It is good karma resulting from good action, honestly, simply, and, and gently uh, used to help other people. Good karma is sometimes simply the fact that we do a good deed without even knowing it, because of our instinct to be kind. All these things that we build in character are the great wealth. What we possess physically we leave to our heirs to fight over. But anything that is worthwhile for us to worry about has to go with us when we go. We have therefore built a dichotomy here that is unreasonable. We have assumed that we can live badly here, go to sleep and forget it forever. Nature wouldn't work this way. Nature doesn't waste things like that. We're, nature does not spend millions of years building human beings and then wipe out the consciousness within them. The body that we have, surely we'll lose it. The, the stress is too great. And the physical environment doesn't permit an eternal physical existence. But there is no doubt in the world uh, that something does survive. And what survives is rich or poor according to what we do right here now. And wherever, as is mostly the case, our, after, our appetites and ambitions physically have in them elements of dishonesty. They are not strictly ethical. They are as ethical, we can say, as those of our neighbors, which means nothing. But they are not ethical in the terms of natural law. Therefore, wherever they are, they do not help us in the big picture. They may give us a few days of, of, of so-called success, followed by a tremendous interval of regrets. Now, if you want to really speculate in Dubai, all kinds of odds and ends, the first thing you have to do is get the right attitude toward it. And that it, attitude is that no matter what you buy, how you speculate, or how often you invest, you are never going to have anything. You can simply take what you have to the edge of the grave, and that is the end of it. And that edge with many people is not so far off that it's worth the compromise of integrities that people make in order to get it. 
the individual will destroy himself for a few years of prosperity. It's a very poor deal. And even in the years of prosperity, his problems linger. No one who is prosperous is without responsibilities. So the Zen man says you can have anything you can have that doesn't hurt you. You can do the, anything with yourself that do, you know inside of yourself you will not regret. If you are sure that what you are doing is right for you, you do it, and you pay no attention whatsoever uh, to the hindrances. If you are wrong, you will be told in due time by nature that you are wrong. But if you meant well and did the best you could, that's all it's expected of anyone. So if you want to put a few hundred thousand in the stock market and you don't mind losing it, and you'll be just as happy if you do lose it, you may then be one of the few who win. Because life is just like that. In the article on uh, Zen and archery, this man was a good archer quite a champion and bow, with bow and arrow. And there is a building, uh, Sanju Sangendo in Japan, where the site of which is an archery range. This is about 600 feet. Good long range. And the Japanese archers uh, were very good. They had a small target, but they hit it very regularly. But this American had very trouble, very deep trouble trying to hit the center of the target. He stood and he stretched the bow and he looked down the shaft, the arrow, and he wiggled and twisted and pulled and tightened and closed his eyes and opened them again and blinked and tried to find the target and always missed. So the Zen man came along and talked him a little was He said, don't do it that way. You'll never hit it if you do it that way. If what you want to do is just simply... Take the bow as though you were a child and you didn't care where you hit. Throw the bow in the direction you know it should go. Let nature inst in nature's instinct guide you and just let go of the arrow. You didn't hit a bullseye. He then found out that tension was the thing that was destroying his archery. Tension is the thing that destroys the stockbroker. Tension is the thing that brings the stock market down. Tension is the thing that breaks homes, destroys health, and does all kinds of foolish and silly things to people. Zen says don't have it. Whatever you do, do it with all your spirit and with all your complete self-discipline. If you're going to fall off of something, fall off and relax completely. And sort of say to yourself, here goes nothing. And you probably won't be hurt. Grace with everything you've got and you'll break your neck. Tension, therefore, is one of the things in business and in home life and in everything that you do. The tense broker is going to have a nervous breakdown after every drop in the stock market. The uh, tense family will have a broken home when everything goes wrong. Everywhere tension, stress, and the building up of defenses against truth are dangerous occupations. We can build no defense against truth. It has to have its own way. And the only way we can cooperate with it is when it sets in, say, here, come and take it. In other words, truth must have its way. And it's fighting truth that's killing people every day. It is fighting truth that is destroying nations. It is fighting truth that destroys the integrities of life. And it is this same thing that creates ordinary human beings and transforms them into guerrillas and anarchists. It is this tremendous flow of essential ignorance. And this ignorance is due to the simple fact that the individual has never even tried to understand himself. He's never given a day's thought or a day's understanding to the wonderful being that he is inside himself. He may have concealed that wonderfulness pretty thoroughly, but at the same time it's there. There's something about the human being that is divine, even at his worst moments. But there's something there that is tremendous, infinite, something in indescribable. The physician can never sound its depths. 
The religionist can never understand its functions. The philosopher can never fully comprehend its meaning. But all these things meet together to one tremendous thing, that the human being, as the Zen man says, is a creature capable of molding itself into the perfection that it needs and, de and nature demands of it. The Zen man knows that he was born to grow. He wasn't born to have. If he has, he'll endure it. He wasn't born to have not. If he has not, he will endure that. He wasn't born to lead other men. Well, then he will be born lead as a follower and will follow. But whatever it is, he will never for a moment lose the nature of the divine purpose within himself. He will learn that all things in which he is inadequate are tests of himself. They are the hindrances that he must overcome. And until he overcomes them, he cannot expect anything but the discomforts that are his daily uh, companions along the way of life. So if you want to be a stockbroker, always say, I am well conditioned. I will never be sorry if I lose. If you want to be a very wealthy man, uh, say, I will never be sorry what I lose. And uh, if I take it to the grave, I will only hope that my descendants will not abuse what I abuse to get it. All the way along, we have these problems to face. But Zen is a philosophy of facing them gently, simply, kindly, softly, but immovably. Zen never for a moment compromising its principles. The stock ma market uh, Zen man, while the business was honorably done, would probably serve it as well as he could. But the moment the time comes when corruption creeps in, a Zen man will step out. He will not for a moment allow himself to be soiled by association with that which he cannot believe to be true. If we would all step out of what we don't believe, we'd some find some big changes in this world. You'd find we'd have much better people in better positions if we demanded of them an integrity and were not worrying so much about their political allegiances. What we need is to support that which is true. And if that which is available is not true, we will build our own inner life on our own. We will correct our own mistakes. We will properly use our own resources. And we will never fail in family or friendship or health or sickness or work or companionship to live according to a principle of integrity. And the principle of integrity is very simple in itself, that we are here in this quest of truth. We are here seeking to know the reality. And if we are going to learn the reality, if we are going to have the courage to search for the real, then we must have the courage also to live with it if we find it. We must be prepared to live the right kind of life before we can uh, look for it courageously. But then comes the interesting thing. Well, we are thinking of all the things we have to do without in order to be good. When we think of all the bad habits we have to correct in order to be happy, it looks tremendous. But the Zen man makes the most interesting discovery of all. That when he lives straight, he hasn't any of these problems. He has not one single thing to worry about. He hasn't lost a thing. The only thing he has really been de deprived of is his troubles. He is, finds that the, the true life of the Zen man is happier than any other person can possibly be because he cannot lose. He has no sense of loss, no sense of gain, only sense of service, only sense of being true to the great universal structure to which he belongs. He moves himself from a citizen in Lower Manhattan to a citizen of the universe. He becomes part of the great motion of life toward the fulfillment of, himself, of itself. This is the true journey. And no one who takes that journey weeps over it or is sorrow about it or is tired as a result of it. 
we are always sick and tired and worried and defeated because we are wrong in our conduct. If we are right in our conduct, this fades away and we discover an immutable good, a tremendous value, a great and marvelous extension of consciousness so that we can meet the problems of the day without problem or without sorrow. <clears throat> we will be all right as long as we keep the rules. And in this life, we are building towards something better. We are toiling, toiling towards a bigger universe than we have ever known. And it is necessary, particularly now, with our present realization of world affairs, to recognize the obvious, to accept the real with a full understanding of what it means. We can no longer deny these things. We can no longer hide them. We can no longer conceal a war behind some foreign front. It is everywhere. We cannot see poverty beside, because of some one nation in trouble. Every nation. We cannot have the religious upheavals. They're everywhere. Never before has the whole world been involved in its own karma as it is today. Never before has it become so apparent to everyone, everywhere, that the path of glory leads but to the grave. We are learning little by little, and in the next few years we will learn more rapidly. But today and right now, as we start along the way of tomorrow, it is possible for the thoughtful person to see the facts, to become aware of the things that are going wrong, and make sure that there is nothing in his own life that is doing the same thing, that he is not making in a small way the same mistakes that in a big way are endangering civilization. The time of selfishness and self-interest and exploitation are done. They have dominated science, religion, philosophy, and industry for ages. But we have gradually come to the point where our little planet, which is our home, which is the place we have earned the right to be in at the moment, can no longer survive our mistakes. We are going to have to start to think of the planet itself as the great sick person, and that that sickness has been caused by the creatures that live on it, and that the time has come when the healing of the world demands that the people on the world get over their grudges, economize their resources, and work together in friendship and in amity. It is the only way we can solve the problems of the moment. Well, I guess that's it. And uh, <laughs> uh, Monday evening at 7.30, my wife is speaking in the lecture hall upstairs, and the subject will be the, the interpretation, the truth of about the coming age that we are all facing. We know that many of you will be interested. Thank you very much.